Today's, today's lecture is really about examples. We really need much more examples before putting our hands in the crucial question, which is what does it really measure the Gauss curvature, okay? That's kind of the fundamental question behind our back, but let's freeze it for another one or two lectures and uh, let's have more examples to work with, okay? So families of examples, actually not isolated examples like the plane or the sphere, I mean, let's, let's try to build up some big families of examples. So the first type of examples I want to discuss are surfaces of revolution. <clears throat> Revolution actually in geometry means rotation, okay? These are not angry surfaces, okay? <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, so what does it mean? It means you take a curve in some plane, and let's suppose, for example, we start, and actually here I switch from our usual notation. So let's take a curve in the xz plane, okay? Let's take a, doesn't matter, I mean, by, let's take a planar curve, whatever the plane is, by changing name to the coordinates, you call them X and Z, okay? Now, <coughs> that means that in the X, but still, I remember that there is, is, there is a third one, Y, okay? So if I pick a curve, that means it lies on the plane of the blackbird, okay, in my picture. And I, I suppose I'm taking a curve which does not touch uh, the z, okay, the z, the z, the z axis, okay. For example, again, I mean, by chain, I mean, if you want to find an axis, it's enough to find a line which is not crossing this uh, this curve. Well, being in this plane, it means that for some choice of parameter, this curve can be parameterized in the following way. It is some kind. It's a function f of u. Usually I call them t, you know, the parameter on a curve, but of course this will be the first parameter in a two parameters of a, of a surface, so I, now I prefer to call it u, okay? Now it lies in the y equal to zero plane, in the, in the x, x, uh, x, z plane, so it's f zero, and then for some other function, g of u. Don't be confused with the names of the coefficients of the second fundamental form, okay? These are just two functions, okay? There is no, it's impossible to make confusion, okay? And now what do I want to do? So now for on this I just assume, so V, oh sorry, just otherwise I have to keep on being careful about, let me call it V, the parameter on the, on the, cur on the curve, which is rotating. Now the only thing I am assuming here is that F is a positive function, okay? Just to avoid uh, some problems. And this, suppose that this parameter lives in some interval closed or open doesn't really matter, okay? And let's call it AB. In principle, it could be the whole line R or a sub-interval, okay? Now, to each point of this curve, we make a rotation. We have already seen an example of this type. Now, we have, when we constructed the torus of revolution, we have, taken a, we have taken a circle here and rotate every point. So basically now, I drop the assumption it was a circle and I just do it in general, okay? So for each point, so for each fixed value of the parameter V, meaning for each point here, I want to add the circle of radius, this distance, in the horizontal plane, okay? And I want to do it for every point. That means I, I, I'm, I'm not... I'm certainly going to make a disaster, but something like this, okay? I want to build this, this object here. How do I do it analytically? I mean, how can I parameterize something like this? Well, for any point, so that means how can I construct some kind of map whose image from some domain of R2 whose image is something like this? Well, I add another parameter, of course, u, and then I will try to think where this u will live. So such that, for example, u will be the parameter on the circle. I'm perfectly able to parameterize the circle. And actually, the only thing I have to do is to put a cos
You see? This is by brute force. The image of that thing is by brute force what I drew here. Okay? Now, where does this parameter live? You see, for u equal to 0, I get the old curve, f, 0, g. For example, for u equal to pi over 2, I get another profile because this becomes 0, this becomes f, and this, be this is still g. So that means I'm moving. When u, for example, is increasing, I'm rotating in this direction, and then I, I get the same profile, but now in the y, z plane, I mean, whatever, OK? So the curve in this plane here, it has the same shape, but it's on a different plane, OK? And as, as long as I move u, I keep on rotating this profile around. Now, if I want to cover the whole surface, because geometrically I said I want to add for every point of this curve the whole circle, am I, am I able to do it in this way? Here the key point is whole. Well, a local chart has to be defined on an open set. Because, of course, what is the circle? The circle would be cos u sin u with u between 0 and 2 pi. But if I add the extremes of the interval, as I should if I want geometrically the, the image to be the whole circle, uh, the interval is not, is not open. Okay. On the other hand, if I enlarge the interval, I say, well, but OK, who cares? Let's take u to be any real number. But that means I'm keeping on going around and around and around and around many times, periodically around the z-axis. But then that would be good geometrically, but not analytically, because x fails to be injective. And it's one of the properties of a local chart to be a one-to-one -one map on its image. So in some sense, the two things are fighting. I want a one-to-one -one map. And I want it to de define on an interval, on an open set. That's impossible. Okay? If it's open, I'm missing one point. Okay? If it's, if it's one to one, I'm touching one point more than once. So, so I'm dead. Okay? Here I have to take, I'm forced, if I want this to, have, to be a local chart, I'm forced this to, I force this to be defined on. 0 to pi, for example, open. So now our domain u, remember, you always draw this picture, no? x uh, and some domain u. How does it look? Well, this will be, uh, so this is, if this is u and this is v here is 0 to pi, and here I have an a, b, whatever that is, and so basically this is defined over the rectangle, the open rectangle, so this will be my u in the general theory. But this is not enough to cover the whole surface. So that means that this type of surfaces must be covered by at least, at least I have to add another map. In fact, which points are not covered? If I make this choice, the points which are not covered are exactly the ones I started with. So strange enough, OK? I'm losing exactly this profile. Only this profile, but this profile is lost. So I need to add another map which covers these points, if I want to prove that this is a regular surface. How do I do it? Well, and that's the point. Now you are old enough not to be cheat, I mean, to, to be able to cheat without being cheated yourself, OK? Because I add another map, which looks exactly like this. But now u does not lie here, but lies, for example, in any interval which contains 0. So basically, it would be the same x, but defined two, like I look at it twice. Once it's defined on this rectangle, and another time is defined, so, and I would call it u1, if you want. And then I define it on another rectangle, which covers also this, which was the, the part which was missing in my surface, and I call it u2. OK? But if this is the story, I just remember it and I stop writing it. OK? So I, I will always say, I take a surface revolution and a chart like this. Then if I want to make global considerations, I know that I have to take into account this phenomenon. OK?
Now, I can also assume that I was starting from a curve parameterized by arc length. I mean, if it was a regular curve, there is no arm. Every regular curve is parameterized by arc length. So I start with an equation, a differential equation relating f and g. Of course, the tangent vector would be f prime. Of course, when I put prime, it means the derivative with respect to the only variable, which is v. Okay? So the tangent vector would be the vector f prime 0 g prime. The norm of this would be the square root of f prime squared plus g prime squared. And then parameterized by arc length means the norm of this, so the square root of this is equal to 1. So I drop the square root. And I say, I start with a couple of functions, a pair of functions which satisfy something like this. OK? Very well. So let's see what is the curve, what are the curvatures? Lines of curve, everything we did up to now in this specific type of example. You see, it's a very flexible type of examples, okay? Because the curve is general, okay? Now, <clears throat> as long as, of course, so here I, I don't prove that X satisfies the, all the properties of the local chart. I leave it up to you. But here, of course, the only key, key point is that this curve does not touch the z-axis, okay? Because those will be points where it becomes a mess, a rotation, okay? Everywhere else, there is no problem, okay? <coughs> now, so of course, you will need also this, okay? Because I never said, if I start with a curve, for example, I never said that the curve is parameterized in a way that the map is injective. But if I parameterize with arc length, I'm done, OK, for example, in this direction. Just to, but these are all very simple considerations, and now I leave them to you. Now, let's compute everything. Well, as usual, stop thinking and, and write. So xu minus sin u f. And in fact, just to be quick, f and g are always functions of v, OK? I don't repeat it. So f of v, I, I don't write. Cos, cos u f g. x v, oh, sorry, 0. f uh, x v is uh, cos u f prime. Sin u f prime g prime. Then let's go on. x u u. x u u is minus cos u f minus sine u f 0. x u v, x u v, uh, <coughs> x u v, x u v, I take this and I take the derivative with respect to v, so it's minus sine u f prime, cos u f prime 0. x v v is cos u f double prime sin u f double prime g double prime then what else n and now remember these are the moments where sometimes you have to switch on the brain okay because of course i'm going to write n on one of these charts so nobody has told me that this surface is orientable okay so on the part on the part covered by one chart of course it's orientable and i can define the usual n so x u wedge x v divided by its norm. So let's do it since I wrote it. I wrote them almost in line. So this is what? This is cos u f g prime. Now, of course, the chance of making a mistake is very high. So please double check. Sin u f g prime. Minus sine squared FF prime minus cos squared FF prime. So FF prime. Okay. And then this divided by its norm. I don't even write it. Okay. I'll put them, I'll put it at the end. <clears throat> 
Sorry? Oh, minus FF prime, yes. Actually, the only thing I, well, okay, in fact, for once, let's put what, what should be as a denominator because, of course, uh, I switched the brain off a bit too early. Um, you see, this is a multiple of F, okay? So since I'm going to normalize, this is irrelevant, okay? I mean, meaning I take this out, no, because I have to take the unit normal in this direction. F is a positive function, so I don't care. I take it out, I remove it, and then below there will be, a, as a denominator, there will be just what? In fact, let's write it because it's curious. It's this squared. So cos squared G prime plus sin squared G prime, so G prime squared, plus F prime squared. But it's the only thing I know, actually. So in fact, there is no denominator. Okay? So the, the parameterized by arc length here becomes nice. Well, but actually you should be able, I, I'll go on with the exercise in some sense under this assumption, but actually often we will deal with uh, example. I mean, when I give you a curve and I rotate it, maybe this, this thing is not satisfied. So remember how to adjust things. I mean, don't take the formula that we are going to get for granted for any curve, okay? Okay, so in this case, we can go on in this way. So and remember, this holds on the part of the surface covered by this chart, okay? Well, but actually, since we raised the problem, let's solve it immediately. So this vector field, of course, is born on the image of x, okay? Now the point is, does it extend differentiably to the points which are not covered? So in this specific case, I know that x touches the whole surface minus this curve. So at every point, I have a normal vector, okay? At every point minus this, cu this, uh, this curve. So I can ask, if I go to the limit here, is this n extendable to a differentiable object? And I can see it immediately. Of course, this is not a general, that's not what you do in general. Because of course, if you have a surface which is covered by many charts, extending from one chart to the other, it's okay. But I mean, here the point is that the whole surface is covered by two, and the points which are missing in one are a closed subset. Okay, so, so what does it mean? I take the limit when I approach this curve, the, the missing curve. I'm taking the limit as u tends to zero or u tends to two pi, okay, on one side or the other. Is this vector field extendable in a differentiable way? Well, yes, it's already written here, which is the extension. Okay, this formula, of course, makes perfectly sense when u is defined over the whole r, okay? So this one extends, and so the surface is orientable, okay? Now we probably have everything to start computing first and second fundamental form. What is E? It's sine squared f squared plus cos squared f squared, so it's f squared. Now, don't be confused, eh? It's G is what? It's scalar product between these two. So minus sine cos FF prime plus sine cos FF prime, so G is zero. Sorry, uh, capital F, okay? And then capital G, let me write it here so I save a bit of space. It's cos squared F prime squared sine squared, so it's f prime squared plus g prime squared. So again, it's one, but here, please remember, because you, you are going to find an exercise where the curve is not parameterized by arc length. If you use this formula, it's a disaster, okay? If it's parameterized by arc length, it's one. And now, little letters. 
x u u n, so that's minus cos squared f g prime minus sine squared f g prime, so it's f g prime plus zero. So it's minus f g prime. Okay? Little f in the sense of the second fundamental form. It's x u v n, so it's minus sine cos f prime g prime plus sine cos f prime g prime plus zero. So f is equal to zero, and little g is this one times this, so it's cos squared f double prime g prime plus sine squared. So it's f double prime g prime minus f prime g double prime. Okay. So if I ask you which are the principal curvatures, be careful, because now this looks like already a diagonal matrix, no? The second, I mean, the coefficients of the second fundamental form, but what we really have to do, remember, in, the, in, the, in, the, in our notation of the proof is to compute the matrix A, okay? So since this one will come in as a renormalization, so, um, so the matrix associated, once I know this, which are simple to compute, I compute the matrix associated to minus dn, okay? So the matrix associated to minus dn, so minus dn, becomes associated with respect to the standard basis to, remember, E, G, uh, sorry, E, F, F, G to the minus 1, E, F, F, G, okay? So then I compute it. In my particular case, I substitute here what I found, and this becomes F squared, 0, 0, 1 inverse times minus f g prime, 0, 0, and this expression of second order, f double prime g prime minus f prime g double prime, okay? Now the inverse of this, I don't even have to think, no? it's 1 over f squared, 1, 0, 0, so basically this is dividing by f squared here, so this becomes the matrix minus g prime over f, 0, 0. Um, and this expression, f double prime, g prime, minus uh, f prime, g double prime, divided by f, f prime, double prime, divided by f squared. Okay, now you can say that these are the principal curvatures. So you see there is a scaling factor, okay, which comes in. So the difference between the eigenvalues of this and the eigenvalue of what we really care is this object here. Being diagonal, it means just it's renormalizing, okay? Now, I don't really know which one is smaller than the other, depending on the functions f and g, okay? Now, because I, I should say now, k1 is equal to this and k2 is equal to that, or maybe it's the other way around, I don't know. But these are the two principal curvatures, okay? So these are, these two are k1 and k2 at the corresponding points. And the Gauss curvature is, uh, is the product of these two, okay? And the mean curvature is what it should, okay? Now, of course, this is different from what I got in my notes. So where did I make, there is an exponent different. So, 10 seconds to find either a mistake here or a mistake there.
Okay, as a sub-exercise is to double check if everything is correct. Now I don't have time to find it. That's already a good. Sorry, you are right. Oh, OK, OK, OK. I got it. OK, sorry. No, no, I, I divided by f squared everything. No, this is dividing by f squared only this one. OK, very good. So the exercise is done. And these are the two principal curvatures. Now, the only thing you can argue is if what do we know? Do we know anything about this function here? Well, not much, but certainly can be simplified a bit. So just let me double check if now. OK, so now we are in perfect shape. Now, is this function something that we can simplify? In some sense, yes. Remember, you have this equation here. OK, so I can take the derivative of this. And I get an extra, a new equation of second order, because here there are second derivatives coming in, and which, of course, are, uh, which is what? I mean, of course, here I would get twice, twice, and 0. So the 2, I drop it immediately. So this becomes f prime, f double prime. So that equation, if I differentiate it, I get f prime plus f, uh, f double prime plus g prime. g double prime is equal to 0, OK? But that means, so for example, the Gauss curvature, which was the product, so this implies, so k was independently of this equation, was just the product of these two, no? So it was, um, well, okay. So here there is nothing too interesting to be discovered. F double prime g prime uh, minus f prime g double prime. But here now I can make a substitution. And here, OK, I leave it to you. It's just f double prime over f, OK? You see, well, it's just taking, here you have a g prime, g double prime. No? And you take it out of this equation, you put it back, and you see what's going on, OK? Now, well, because of course this is a simple expression that you can analyze. So for example, when, uh, what does it mean it's positive or negative? So right, we need to, well, but independently, I mean, remember the geometric interpretation we gave. That's why we wrote the geometric interpretation of elliptic points and hyperbolic points in words to avoid exactly, so the interpretation by saying if I cut with the tangent plane, the surface lies on one side or it crosses the tangent plane, this is, a, this is a way to say it independently of the choice of n. Okay? That's why instead of saying the formula, we wrote all this dissertation in English. Okay? So for example, it's, it's clear that this point should be an elliptic point. And in fact, all the points rotate, rotate. You see, in fact, first observation, this function, now let's go back to, this depends only on v. The Gauss curvature depends only on v and not, of, and not on u, which it's a good check. It had to be like this, OK? Meaning, if some point has some property, then every point on the circle has the same property, OK? Points on the same circle are, of course, tot are absolutely the same. Okay, so if something holds here, it has to hold over the whole circle, and this point should be clearly elliptic. Okay. While, for example, this point should be hyperbolic, because you have one direction of rotation which turns left and one direction of the curve, which turns right, meaning if I cut with the tangent plane, I cross it, OK? And so on. And where it's 0? Well, f is a positive function. Well, in any case, it's a denominator. But I mean, this is positive. So the only way this is 0 is where f double prime is 0, OK? So points where the second derivative of this function here are 0. 
Okay. Okay. Mm. Okay. That's it. That's a nice family of examples. Uh, you see, the remark I made about the orientability of this type of surface, you can now play, use it also here. This formula holds on the part of the surface which is covered by this map X, where X is defined with these bounds, with this limitation. So now if I ask you how much is this Gauss curvature here, in principle you should not be answering. You should shut up and repeat the computation with the other chart. But being the chart given by the same function, just defined on a different interval, the final formula will be the same. So in fact, this formula holds hold globally. This is an accident of this specific situation, of course. Eh? There's nothing general here. Okay. It's a strange type of surfaces which are not covered by one chart, but by many charts, for example, two. But somehow the, express, the analytic expression is the same, so whatever I, 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 I compute holds globally. Okay, very well. Now, just as a specific example, in fact, you know one example of this, of course. Well, the torus, we did it. You have a question? Sorry. But you need to speak much louder. I mean, <laughs> I'm used to two years old kids. So the tone, the average tone of the voice is above shouting, okay? <laughs> Right, but I, rem I remember mentioning to you this problem when we, when we made the computation. In fact, one of you came in my office. So the question is, there is a discrepancy between this and what we did in, the, in class when we proved the, this formula for representing first, second fundamental form and uh, the matrix associated with this. Okay, now there was a problem there. There was a minus one missing or for some funny reason, you switch n. Because of course you have this freedom, no? I mean, at some point you can decide that instead of n, you use minus n, okay? So if you go back there and you try to be a bit more precise than what I was, you should, if I remember, there is a minus there missing, okay? Right, okay. It's, uh, now, Specific case, the torus of revolution, so you can apply. The sphere is, of course, another example, but you, don't, you cannot get the whole sphere by, with this trick, okay? Because you want a curve which does not touch the axis of revolution. So if you want to draw the sphere as a surface of revolution, you are bound to take this curve, of course, the profile of half a circle, but without the North Pole and the South Pole. And now this problem about the North Pole and the South Pole is not the problem we faced here. It's another problem. So if I take another chart of this form, I will never cover the North Pole and the South Pole. Okay? So the sphere minus two antipodal points, you can put it into this picture. If you want to cover, of course, you can play another game just for the accident that the sphere has so many symmetries. Of course, the sphere is also the surface of revolution of this curve. Okay, so in some sense, it is a surface. It's globally, you can define it as a surface revolution. Or you do another, in fact, more interesting trick, is that you analyze what happens to this picture when the curve touches the axis of revolution. Because really, what we feared is this kind of situation, for example. If you rotate something like this, certainly you are not getting a regular surface. This is kind of cusps, okay? These points are clearly bad. 
But, so this shows you that the, there is a problem. Even if, of course, there is a bigger problem if the curve crosses the axis. But even if it doesn't cross, there is a problem. But if the curve touches the axis of revolution with a velocity orthogonal, then the problem disappears, at least at first order. So here the problem is smoothness. Okay? So C1, you just require that this is orthogonal. If you want more, you require more conditions. Okay? So it's not that if, if the curve touches, you are dead. There are extra conditions. In the case of the sphere, all these extra conditions are satisfied. If you rotate this profile, you still get a regular surface. Okay? Anyway. Spe another specific example, famous specific example of surface of revolution. Since it's important for another special lecture I would like to give you later. I guess, yeah. In fact, Thursday probably. Well, we have seen, for example, the elliptic uh, paraboloid, no? for example, as another example of surface of revolution. One, not every elliptic paraboloid, because elliptic paraboloids could have ellipses as sections. The one we studied in, in, in a previous example had a exactly a circle as section. In that case, it's a surface of revolution. Okay? Now, there is a very famous surface in this family, which you should know, which is called the catenoid. Oh, well, okay. What is the catenoid? The catenoid is what you get by rotating. So remember, the, our choices were the, the two functions f and g, no? Uh, little f and little g, which gives the curve, and then everything becomes automatic. So in this case, I write you directly the, the map x. Uh, it's just the hyperbolic cosine of v. There is no point in putting another parameter times cos u. Uh, hyperbolic cosine of v sine u, u uh, v, uh, v, a v. Okay. So it basically, well, this a is totally irrelevant. It's just one parameter, a shrinking parameter. Okay. So suppose it's just a positive number. So you see, in this case, I've chosen g to be uh, this function. And f is a cos cosh, okay? How does it look? In the, so you see in particular, well, besides dividing by a, which is not important, you can think of it as a, as a graph of a function. So forget now the u, put u equal to zero. So meaning we are, rot we are looking at the curve a cosh v, 0, a v. So you see the z, the x component is a graph over the z component, okay? So if I draw it, if this is the z axis, I think of it, and this is the x axis, I think of it as a graph in this direction, okay? It's a graph over z which gives me some x. And what is the function which, which I should draw? Cosh. OK, but cosh, I know. It's something like this. Actually, here, parameters are, so v is any real number. I should always be careful about so where, where everything is defined. And u is between 0 and 2 pi for one chart and minus pi, pi for another chart, if I want. Okay. So if I draw the whole thing, I get something which looks like a parabola. In fact, this curve, if you put it in the standard uh, picture, has a, has a famous name. It's called a catenary. So just the curve itself. In fact, the curve itself was very famous. 
You know why? Have you ever encountered this curve? In bridge. Sorry, in bridge, you said that? Yes. In bridge. Meaning you, you have even studied some kind of static or dynamics of buildings. That's, that's, the, that's the place where it was born. Okay, in fact, it looks like, especially if you put it the other way around, upside down, it looks like an arc. Okay, so that's exactly the shape of an arc. But it's also, in fact, that's kind of second step. The first step, when it, when it was born, it was born in uh, late 17th century to solve one of the most simplest problems. Actually, so the cal calculus, calculus of variations, I mean, mathematical physics, call it how, how you want it, was born by looking at very simple problem, if you look back. But still, enough to create cal uh, differentiable calculus, okay? Pick two points and pick a wire, okay? Is this long enough? Well, okay, I don't want to take my belt as a wire, otherwise this lecture becomes too informal, <laughs> okay? Pick, pick a wire, a long wire, and take two points, hold it at two points at the same height, okay? Now, there is gravity, there is a force, in nature, and there is a resistance on the Y. Along the Y, there is a resistance because, of course, it has some kind of tension, okay? So which is the shape of the Y? You know, mathematics or mathematical physics, I mean, was born through letters, through challenges, okay? In the old times, they didn't have MathSignet or email or publishing journals, or journals, so the way things, Somebody made a discovery and wrote to everybody famous in mathematics saying, ah, I'm the best mathematician alive because I know how to solve this problem. Are you able to solve this problem too? Actually, this happened historically many times and many important discoveries were actually done in this way, okay? Because of course, if nobody could in a reasonable amount of time answer back, that really meant that this guy was one of the best. And so some king, some prince, some would hire him or her. Well, at those times her was very rare, <laughs> okay. But was hire him and cover him with gold because of course for a prince or a king to have the best mathematician alive at those time it was important. Now nobody cares, okay. So. <laughs> so what happened with this curve? So this, this was the problem, this was the challenge that Galileo made to everybody. I can be slightly, yesterday evening I was not able to double check what I'm saying, but I mean, I'm not sure if Galileo was the one answering or the one challenging, but I mean, take a nice book of history of mathematics and you will find the real truth. But I mean, if I'm wrong, I'm slightly wrong, okay? And he said, oh, I know the solution. In fact, he wrote it in a book. And the solution is the parabola. Galileo was already Galileo. As I said, well, Galileo is the best, I mean, uh, the parabola. For many years, this was considered the solution. And then somebody came up and said, okay, Galileo is Galileo, he's very good, I mean, uh, relativity, okay, Jupiter, whatever you want, but it, I keep on finding something else, not the parabola, okay? In fact, I find the catenary. Oh, which the name, I mean, the name is really, catenary in Latin means uh, the shape of a wire, okay? So, so then discussions, no, you're wrong, no, Galileo, this is the truth, okay? The catenary was born in this way. So it, it is one of the most famous mistakes by Galileo, okay? Now, you see, at, the, at those times they didn't, I mean, they, did, they, were, they didn't know what a hyperbolic cosine was, okay? So, and it was one of these, uh, we will see in 20 minutes another famous example of this phenomenon. Okay, but now you have everything. Now I erased the formula, but now they are easy because you see G is, this, is essentially the identity times A 
So G prime is A, G double prime is zero, F is this, so F prime is okay, A sine H, so you don't switch sign, okay? And uh, a double prime is, uh, uh, you put anything together, so I don't repeat the computation. And in fact, I tell you also the mean curvature, which I didn't write because it's th that long formula, formula involving uh, all the letters, okay, E, F, and G, capital and lower. And the H turns out to be zero, identically zero. K turns out to be minus, in fact, Minus it's okay, because this is kind of a convex function. So every point, you expect every point to be hyperbolic. Because you see, at every point, the tangent plane will have one direction going one way and one direction going in the opposite way. So it will cross the surface at every point. So every point should be hyperbolic, so it should be minus something. And the something is simple, it's just a squared cosh squared, cosh 4 v. Okay? This is just by substituting. Substituting, uh, substituting with care. Because in this case, this is not a principally uh, a par a parameterization by arc length of the catenary. F prime squared plus G prime squared is not one. So you have to take the formula corrected with the right denominators. Remember, there was this denominator that at some point was one, and now it's not one. Okay? So, for example, another famous example. This, again, this was born in the same way. This time was not Galileo to make the mistake. You take another famous curve arising in nature. <coughs> this is, the problem is this one. It, it has many strange famous name. But basically, suppose there is a donkey here connected with a wire to a stone here. Okay, so this is a donkey in mathematics, okay? And now the donkey starts moving, or the ox, depends which animal you prefer, starts moving in this way at uniform speed. So that's a very standard situation. No? You have something on your back, but you move orthogonally. You start moving orthogonally, which is the trajectory of this object. Okay, well, you expect it to be something like this, okay, more or less. Well, let's put names to the more or less, and I take this curve here, and now, instead of doing, I rotate it in this direction, okay? So this is the surface I want to look at. Actually, it's a nice exercise in calculus. So describe the differential equation. So this function, this subject, this curve will be described by two functions, f and g. It's a curve in, plane, in the plane. So which kind of differential equation does it have to satisfy to be the solution to this problem? Of course, here the constraint is that this, ob this wire has no fixed norm. I mean, it's, it's a piece of wood. It's not a, a, a spring, OK? It's not elastic. OK, so I can tell you directly the end of the story. So x of uv in this case, I, actually by changing names to the coordinates, I will keep on using the same notation. It's an, of course, it's enough to call now this z and this x. Okay, I don't care. And this becomes cosh av cos u cosh av sine u, and then g, I should put here g of v, okay? 
But G of V, I gave you just uh, implicitly the definition. So this is the integral between 0 and V of 1 minus A squared sine hyperbolic sine squared of AT, everything to the power 1 half. And don't be surprised that this looks like the norm of a vector, because that's the way it's ar it arises, dt. OK? Now, in this case, this curve is parameterized by arc length. I mean, this is the convenience of this. In, in some sense, you do, you, it's more difficult to draw, but analytically simple, because g prime, of course, is this function. If I take f prime, f prime is this, f is this, so f prime squared plus g prime squared, so I throw away this half, and I get 1 by the standard identities of hyperbolic functions, OK? Cosh minus sine ch is equal 1, OK? So here, you, on this example, you can really apply the formula without being careful of the denominators I was mentioning in the case of the catenoid. And this becomes, interestingly enough, here the, mo the only interesting thing is the Gauss curvature. Also, in this case, you, you expect it to be negative just by looking at the picture. Okay? But actually, the, the little surprise is that it's a constant. Okay? It's a surface of negative constant curvature. Okay? Of course, this is non-compact. So it's not contradicting anything. In fact, you might wonder whether there is a theorem saying in the non-compact case that this is the only possibility. Now this, uh, actually I forgot to tell you the name of the curve. The name of the curve is the tractrix. Okay? This is of the curve. In fact, the surface, I don't think it has a famous name by itself. It's the revolution of the tractrix, OK? Of course, it, uh, uh, Italians call it the Dini, Dini surface, but I suspect it's just a nationalistic. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the implicit function theorem in Italy is Dini's theorem, so nobody knows outside Italy this name. So I suspect that even in this case, this is not the official name. Please, there was a question. No. <laughs> anyway, if you have a, a, a favorite book of history of mathematics, this was the, cent the, the curve, again, not the surface. The curve was at the, cent at the center of another of this discussion. Okay? In this case, I think it was Newton solving the problem. Okay? I think Newton was challenged by somebody that I don't remember, and he came up with the explicit parameterization of this curve. Now, now, OK, so this is enough as general theory and specific examples of surfaces of revolution. In the last half an hour, mm, I'd like to talk to you about the other famous big family of surfaces, which will help us making geometric considerations about the Gauss curvature. OK. And these are called ruled surfaces. In some sense, you would like to say that a ruled surface is a surface which has the property that for every point, there is a straight line passing through this point contained on the surface. Ruled means it's covered by lines, by straight lines. OK? So how do we get kind of a more formal definition of this fact? So first. Let me define what is a, a one-parameter family. So a one-parameter, well, this is just, I mean, don't make a big effort to remember these things, OK? These are just to speed up later, OK? One-parameter family of straight lines is 
is a pair, alpha of t, w of t, is a correspondence. Let me write there everything, even though it's quite clear. I mean, it's a correspondence that assigns to each time t in some interval i, okay? A point, two things. So I want, a, in some sense, a map which defines for any t a point alpha of t in R3 and the vector w of t. The only thing, let's start avoid the trivialities. I want this vector to be always non-zero. Otherwise, it, everything becomes really stupid. Okay. And of course, these maps, so basically these two, in, in some sense, alpha and w are vector fields. Okay. But in some sense, what I'm thinking of alpha as a point and w as a vector. Okay. There are two vectors in R3. And of course, in a differentiable, both, they have to be differentiable way. Okay. So what do I do with something like this? If I have a, if I have a, a, a one parameter family of lines, of course, that means, so I'm thinking, so you see, if, if I want to draw, I just, I should draw basically two curves in R3. One is alpha and one is W. In some sense, I want them to interact in the following way, that for each time t, I want to think at alpha as kind of the base point, a passing point, and w as the uh, directional vector of a straight line. Okay, so I would really like to think of alpha as the base point and w a vector pointed here, and I want to consider the whole line passing through alpha with this direction. Okay, this is the way I want to use alpha and w. Well, what does it mean? That if I have something like this, I look at, so what is this curve, this line? Well, what are the points covered by this line? Well, for any t, so now this will be, x will be a function of t and v. I look at alpha of t plus v w of t. So that's the way. So for each t, if I let that v varying on r, I'm parameterizing exactly this line, okay? So now V is any real number. So T varies where it should, I. But V, I can take it any real number. So I take the whole straight line. So the image of a map like this, so the image is called a root surface. Because really, as a set, it has the property I was telling you at the beginning. So as a set, the image of this map has the property that there is a point and a vector. That in fact, for every point of the image of this. Can, do you have a little geometric uh, intuition of what's going on? So basically, alpha is moving in some way in time. Also, W is moving in time. So W, at, at for the same T, was here. When alpha is here, maybe W is here. And when alpha is here, maybe W is here. OK? And so that means I'm, try, I'm keeping on adding these lines. OK? So this object, as a set, has the property I was telling you. Because now, give me any point of this set. It has to be on one of these lines. So, OK, that's it. So give me a set. And so that means there is a po through this point, there is one straight line all contained in this set, OK, by definition. Okay. Now, these lines, so let me, call, let me give a name, uh, even though I don't think I'm going to use it. So for each t, I have a special line. So LT, which is really 
uh, so it is the line alpha of t plus v w of t, meaning now I, I think of t as fixed and v moving, is called, so this line, the line is called, or the family of this line is called a ruling of this surface. Alpha, alpha is called directrix. And that's it. We don't give a name to W. In some sense, it's the family of directions of the rulings. So examples. Because now we have to be much more careful than before. At the, at the first step. Well, of course, example zero. So we, do you know rule surface? How, which rule surfaces do you know? That's already example two, probably. Example zero is the plane. But, but that's already very interesting. Now it's, not, it's, it's zero plus. I mean, okay, it's 0 0.1. Because, okay, suppose it's exactly the plane of the blackboard, okay? Why do you tell me that this is a ruled surface? Well, you have to produce me alpha w and tell me that the plane is the image of an x. Sorry, he, you, you said two axes. I don't know uh, how, what does it mean, two axes? Uh, that's what I heard. So you define the plane by the x axis and the y axis. You see, if you tell me something obvious, I have to say, well, probably okay. But what, what is alpha when you say you define it as, as two axes? What is alpha? X, okay. And W? Well, so, so first proposal, use Cartesian coordinates. In that case, you would be tempted to say alpha of T is something like T zero, I guess. Okay, so the point on the x-axis. Now use the other coordinate as direction. So that means w of t is what? Zero, one. Constant. It's constant. It's 0, 1. Now it is true that every point, of course, is of the for every point of the plane is of the form alpha plus v something. Okay, it's, in fact, it's x, I mean, t equal to x, and uh, v equal to y. OK, one possibility. By the way, I saw hand wavings showing me circles, or in fact, somebody doing like this, which was the most mysterious to me. You are not looking at me anymore, but you, sh you, you did something like that. I mean, I don't understand what, what does that mean. Well, in some sense, for example, polar coordinates is another obvious choice. No? Alpha of t is equal to a point of, for example, on a unit circle, but you don't care, of any radius. Okay? Cos t sine t. No? No, no, now I'm thinking, parameterize the plane using, in some sense, polar coordinate. That means I move it here, and of course, every time I'm here, I take the line in the same direction. So in this case, W of t is again cos t sine t. It's the point itself. That works. Can you take 0, 0 as alpha of t? 0, 0 as alpha of t. Sorry, what does it mean? Alpha t equals 0. Oh, that's another interesting proposal. Alpha of t is equal 0, 0. So your colleague is saying, why move the point? Stay still in, in the origin and move the vector. 
in the same way, actually. Again, in fact, this is even more polar coordinates in some sense. Well, no, oh, okay. So, okay, the, the plane was 0, 0, 0.0 plus the example, but it's already telling you that maybe there is absolutely no canonical way in fact, why one should be better than the others? No, there is nothing better than the other here, okay? But there is no canonical way to, given a set which has the geometric property that we want, so for every point there is a line, to actually write down alpha and w, okay? So this was already a good... Uh, so do you know other examples? One, your colleague, okay, let's... The cylinder. So in the, in the case of the cylinder, and I think by the cylinder you mean the one constructed over S, the, the circle and then you add the vertical lines. Okay, now we are immediately going to generalize this. But in this case, why this should be a ruled surface in this language? Again, you can pick alpha of t to be the circle. And now... W of t is always the vertical one. Sorry, now it's a space curve, no? So, for example, in the z equal to zero plane, and this is zero, zero, one. You see, at every point of this, I add the vertical line. So this is of, of the same length, okay? Right, in fact, let me give you a general definition of cylinder now, because now it's clear that the circle has nothing interesting. Uh, in fact, suppose you have a planar curve, alpha of t suppose alpha of t is contained in some p, so you start with a curve in a plane wherever it is, and suppose W of t is constant. So what, what's really going on here? Now the plane might be anything. You have a curve in a plane. So maybe this plane will have a normal vector, but I'm not even taking the normal direction. So you see how many accidents there are in this example. I'm taking the circle and the normal to the plane. Why? I build a, a general cylinder would be something for which there is a curve in a plane and one direction, maybe. But the, the, the point is, at every point of this curve, you need to take the same direction. Okay? So even on, on the circle, why taking the orthogonal cylinder somehow? You can take something like this. Okay. And we still call it a cylinder. It's somehow with directrix, the circle, and direction, whatever, okay. the vector w. So this would be a general cylinder. But then, of course, there is another obvious family of ruled surfaces, which are cones. You see, in some sense, the plane is everything. The plane is a cylinder. Mm. It's kind of, it's, it's a pathological cylinder, if you want. No? In this picture here, you see that it's a cylinder. I never said that this vector should be constant and outside the plane. Okay? Of course, that's a very pathological situation, but why not? Okay? Cones. Cones are what? How do I define in this language cones? So it's a ruled surface where, again, alpha of t is contained in some plane p, which, remember, is not required by the general definition of ruled surface. Eh? So you start with a special curve, mainly, namely a planar curve. And the rulings... All pass through a given point 
P0. Okay, so what does it mean? Uh, not now, now, well, okay, there would be the kind of the pathological situation, but let's, let's try to avoid a little bit pathologies too much, okay? So, of course, what, we, what is this point? This point is the vertex of the cone. But you see, again, I'm not, draw, I'm not drawing, I mean, it's, it's a clear generalization of the standard picture, because, I mean, of course, the standard picture is this. No? Okay, so alpha would be, for example, one of these sections, for example, and W would be the vector which makes it going to the vertex at every point. Or you can be even smarter. You can take this section. Alpha is constant and W is rotating in this circle here. That defines the same object, okay? That's another way to put it. Very well. Another, so these are kind of general families, so cones and cylinders. Let's see and, and the most famous ruled surface besides this, which is one of the quadrics. So it's something defined by a degree two polynomial in R3. So we are at example three. Example three. Okay, example three, hyperboloid of revolution. One sheet hyperboloid. Okay. Remember to the to pronounce it with a long E, okay? Now, what is the surface? S. So it's something you want. It has to be of revolution. So there has to be, remember, the trick of classifying quadrics is by cutting with planes and seeing which kind of conic. So now, first you classify conics. Then you pass to quadrics. No? And you say, okay, so it has to be of revolution, so one of these sections must be a circle. Otherwise, there is nothing rotating. Hyperboloid of one sheet, it means the other sections, well, another of these sections is an hyperbola. And the third section, one, two, and three. It's another hyperbola. So two hyperbola and the, and the circle. Okay? That means... The equation is like this. x squared plus y squared minus z squared is equal to 1. Okay? And geometrically, well, geometrically it looks like this. Well, I should have first drawn something like this. These are of, this is, of course, a surface which is very popular in Italy because we tend to see it. Okay? In fact, in Italy, it has an Italian name. It's called the spaghetti shape. <laughs> now, because one minute of cooking class. How do you cook spaghetti properly? First, you boil the water first without putting the spaghetti inside. Okay, don't do that. You boil the water, you take a bunch of spaghetti, you put them as a cylinder. That's easy. Now, if you're not Italian, you throw them in the water. And then they get stuck, and you throw them away. Okay? If you are Italian, you put them in a cylinder, and you put your hands in this way, and you twist. One way, one direction, up, and one direction, below, and then you put them in the water, and they don't become, they don't glue, okay? Now, or, or Anglo-Saxons, which are clearly much less, I mean, fantasy people, and they have a very sad life, they call this the trash bin, okay? Because that's the typical shape of a bean, 
of, a, uh, of the trash uh, in, in, your, in your office, okay? Now, okay, having said that, these are, the, now the spaghetti picture, besides having one minute of relax, was good to see the two rulings. So this surface, it's a regular surface, you prove it by regular inverse image of regular value, I don't know, you are old enough. The two spaghetti, the, the, the spaghetti put, gets in a position where you can see that there is one family of lines somehow going around in one direction. And there is an arc at the same time, so this is special now besides jokes, because it has two independent rulings. Okay? You see, this family of this line belongs to a family which really rotates goes around, and when you are back here, it really, it's again this one. And this, line, this spaghetto, when you rotate it, goes around in a line, because of course spaghetti are not flexible, and gets back here to the same line. So that means this is, you can write it down independently as in two ways, with the same alpha. Of course, I'm taking alpha to be this section, one of this section, doesn't matter. Okay, how do I do that? Now let's do mathematically this picture. Well, a simple way is to parameterize this surface in this form. It's cos s <coughs> minus v sin s. This is one of the two rulings, actually sine s plus v cos s, v, okay? Okay, it's simple that this satisfies this equation and then you have to prove also the other way around that for every point here there is an s and v for which is of this form. You see, if I take this squared plus this squared minus this squared, it's automatic, okay? If I, if I haven't done mistakes, it's automatic. So, of course, I can split now. Once I write it in this form, I split it as a point, cos s, sin s, zero. And this actually will be my alpha, no? in the z, z equal to zero plane, plus v something, which will be my w. And in this case, is minus sin s, cos s, one, okay? So this is one of the two. In fact, the other one is just by switching these two. Okay, so this is alpha. And this is W. Now, what is special about this? Now, of course, S has become T. Well, a curious and interesting thing is, of course, that W, if you look at it, is really the derivative of alpha plus a constant. So here there is the accident, here is that w is alpha prime plus the vector 0, 0, 1. Now, if I, if I didn't add this, it would be fun, you know? You have, uh, now, now suppose we are in, this, in the plane of the blackboard, otherwise the picture becomes too messy, okay? I'm taking a circle because alpha is a circle. If I take w to be alpha prime without this, of course, this is still a vector in the same plane. And what vector is it? It is the tangent vector. Remember before we, okay, so. And of course, that's why I'm saying switching because I go the other way around, no? I can rotate in one way, I can rotate the other way, and so on. Now, of course, if I think of the surface, in principle, I could use this alpha and this w. And what do I get? A disaster, which actually makes me, because what, which object would be the image of alpha plus vw? The whole plane minus a disk. I mean, I cannot hit any point inside the disk. But oh, clearly, I can hit every point outside the disk. In, in fact, in more than one way, in general. OK? So really, the image of the map here would be not even a surface. 
So big warning, because now we are, we, unfortunately it has become too late, but now we are going to make the theory, up, I mean, our old theory applied to this case. But here the problem starts immediately. The image of X is often not a regular surface for any sorts of reasons. One is this kind of monster, for example. But another one is that clearly, where it's written that x is injective. Remember, x of tv, if I really hope that this is a local parameterization, at least for a piece, I mean, it's alpha plus t plus v w, no? Alpha of t plus uh, v w of t. Well, how can I hope? that this is injected. So why this should not be equal to alpha of s plus uh, u w of s for some choices of tv and su? But this is in general going to be completely false. Think of the cone, for example. It's already here. No? The cone is the prototype situation where the, on a, if every line passes through the same point, <laughs> This map is orthogonal to be injective, okay? For example, no? So we have to do something, but this something will come on Thursday now, okay? Questions? How do you prove it? The other thing, uh, which is which other thing? You said that for all this, there is a step and step procedure. Sorry, either you start speaking very loud or, I mean, I'm going to ignore all the questions. Uh, what I can answer is this. So it's step by the uh, x squared plus y squared minus z squared is equal to x squared. Is it wrong? Well, let's double check it. x squared. So that's cos squared plus v squared sine squared minus twice. In the minus twice, I throw it away immediately, OK? The minus twice uh, goes away. So this is cos squared plus sine squared. So this is the 1, OK? And I throw it away here. So let's see if everything else disappears. The everything else is here is what? It's, uh, it's v plus v squared sine squared plus v squared cos squared. So it's plus v squared minus v squared. How do I prove the other inclusion? Because actually this is a two, if you, if you say that, if I want to say that S is equal to the image of X, of course what I just checked is that the image of X lies here. So the objection of your colleague is how do I prove the other way? In general it's actually tough. Huh? But now fortunately one of these coordinates is already Z. Okay. If one of these coordinates is, I mean, if you know, I mean, this gives you the hint. So call Z, so this object is this one, no? So I, I call V, Z, or, yeah, by brute force. So if you give me this in X, Y, Z, I, I need to tell you, I need to find S and V for which Okay, so how do I get V? Well, that's easy. Because I take the Z and I call it V. Now the problem is how do I find S? Okay, well, but now it's easy again. Because give me a, give me a point here. What is S? S basically is projected down. Here you have a circle and Call S uh, if you want the angle or minus the angle or pi minus the angle, whatever you want, but essentially the angle of this point uh, with respect to the direction. If you want this to be cos S, uh, uh, S will be the angle with respect to the x-axis. Because for S equal to zero, I want to find x, the, 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 the x-axis, no? So 
S will be the angle with respect to the x-axis. So now I define you V and S. And this by construction is exactly. So now I have to check that with my choice of V and S, X of SV is equal to exactly to the point you gave me. Are you with me? No, I'm, I have the feeling I lost you, but I mean. So you ask me, give me a point. X naught, Y naught, Z naught. I need to prove you that this is X of some S naught, V naught. OK? How do, of course, this on S. How do I do it? I tell you. V0, by definition, I define V0 to be Z0. I define S0 to be the angle between the point X0, Y0 in the Z equal to 0 plane. So I take the point that you gave me. I put it down here. And I look at the angle with respect to the x-axis. And I call it S0. Now, I know it's true. But now I have to check that this is S0. With this S0 and this V0, this is true. But this has to be true. I mean, <laughs> I mean now, <laughs> by the way, I, con I constructed S0 V0. 